While I am a proud Canadian, I do not speak French and have no experience with the language in any way, shape, or form. This being said, it is very likely that I will mispronounce the majority of French terms and phrases used in this review. I apologize in advance. Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel where I discuss the historical roots of pop culture products such as movies, comic books, cartoons, and what have you. Today's topic for discussion is the award-winning film, Julie and Julia. For those of you who haven't seen the film, let's start with a quick synopsis. The movie covers a year in the life of Julie Powell, a self-proclaimed government drone, as she cooks and blogs her way through mastering the art of French cooking, a cookbook co-authored by the famous gourmet and TV chef, Julia Child. While one half of the film covers Julie Powell's attempts at making the recipes, the other half falls to book inception as we watch Julia Child navigate her way through 1940s Paris. For the sake of convenience, I'm going to be dividing this video into two parts. Part 1 focuses on Julie Child, while the other will talk about Julie Powell and her story. The Childs and their journey in France began at the port of Le Havre on November 3, 1948, the date being just one of the few minor details that the filmmakers got wrong. They paired and loaded up their car, nicknamed the Blue Flash, and drove off toward Paris. The Childs' apartment in Avon Rue du Université, or the Rue de Lou as Julie liked to call it, was a classic Parisian building with no indoor heating and, as seen in the movie, an overabundance of antique furniture. Julie and Paul actually ended up removing most of the furniture during their stay, but were sure to replace it all upon leaving even going so far as to draw a map to help him remember the location of each piece. While in Paris, Paul Child worked as an exhibit coordinator for the United States Information Services, or USIS. As Dilly put it, his job was to inform the French people, by graphic means, about the aspects of American life that the government deemed important. So basically, he created pro-American propaganda and tended to encourage French citizens to support America and the Marshall Plan. While there can be no doubt that Paul Child was good at his job, he was much more than a pencil-pushing bureaucrat. An intellectual, an artist, and an amateur photographer, Paul's not only a faithful friend and husband, but a welcome contributor to mastering the art of French cooking. Sorry for going on a bit of a tangent there, but I just really thought that Paul Child was a little bit underrepresented in the movie and I wanted to give him his due. The description that we get regarding Paul and Julia's careers in the OSS, or Office of Strategic Services, is very accurate as well. The pair first met in 1944 while they were stationed at Ceylon. Julia worked as head of the registry, where she was in charge of files and processing highly secretive information, while Paul, as head of the organization's visual representation group, created maps and war rooms. Also, just as in the movie, Paul and Julia were 10 years apart in age, with Julia turning 37 their first year in Paris. Just as in the film, Julia's entry to the Cordon Bleu had an uneasy beginning. The course she originally signed up for, which was composed of herself and two French housewives, proved far too simple, forcing her to switch over to a course for professional restaurateurs. For a full year, Julia attended classes at the Cordon Bleu in the company of 11 GIs and her teacher, Chef Bognard, who she described as an incredibly talented chef and instructor. In fact, it was Chef Bognard, not the French ambassador, that convinced the head of the Cordon Bleu, Madame Brassart, to schedule Julia's final exam not once, but twice, as she failed her first attempt. The film's depiction of the infamous Madame Brassart, the American-hating owner of the Cordon Bleu, is unfortunately very accurate. Though not quite as crude as her movie counterpart, the real Madame Brassart was apparently of the belief that Americans couldn't cook, a notion which she felt compelled to share with others. Julie also apparently took issue with the way that Madame Brassart ran the school, as she said that during her time of the Cordon Bleu, they were often short on ingredients and supplies needed to make the recipes. Julia met Madame Simone Beck Fischbacher, aka Simka, at an embassy party for Americans and French citizens involved in the Marshall Plan. The two became fast friends, bonding over their shared love of food, and together with another friend and food lover, Louisette Berthelie, began a cooking school called the Three Gourmets. Julia's pen pal, Avis Devoto, in addition to being a close friend and confidant, was instrumental in the book's publication. It was Avis who suggested that Julia, Simone, and Louisette switch publishers in favor of her husband's publisher, Hugh Mifflin. While Avis' advice and encouragement was irreplaceable to Julia, so much so that she even offered to dedicate the book to her. However, Avis politely refused this honor, stating that Julia should finish the book first and deal with the dedication later, in the event that their friendship fell through before the publication process was over. As in the movie, the friendship between these two developed through correspondence, which began when Julia wrote a letter to Bernard Devoto, Avis' husband, applauding his article regarding stainless steel knives and their inability to keep a sharp edge. Julia's sister, Dorothy, or Dort the Wart, as Julia liked to call her in their youth, was five years younger and one inch taller than her sister, measuring it in a whooping, six foot, three inches tall. The extent of her stay in Paris, as well as the circumstances in which she met her husband, Ivan Cousins, are altered somewhat in the movie, as Dorothy stayed and worked in Paris for a while before her encounter with Ivan Cousins at the American Club Theater, though this was not the first time that the Cousins had laid eyes on Dorothy. While visiting with his friends at Bangdon College in Vermont, Cousins witnessed Dorothy throw a pie into the face of a fellow undergrad, 
an event which led to the invention of perhaps the world's best pickup line, there are only pies lately. The two were engaged to be married by April of 1951, and by 1952, Dorothy wrote Julia to say that she was pregnant. According to her book, this news seems to arouse nothing but happiness from Julia, as her and Paula tried to have children, but decided that it just wasn't going to happen. Though Paul's long and at times very stressful past experience as a school teacher may have been the driving force behind this decision. The difficulties that the child faced during the McCarthy era, from budget cuts to Paul's unwarranted investigation in Washington, are accurate, as is the film's depiction of Julia's thoroughly Republican father. While Julia liked to describe her husband Paul as an intellectual, she often insisted that her father, despite his college degree, was a thoroughly enlightened individual who seldom changed his mind on any subject, and disliked to bring opinions especially where politics were concerned. Though to be fair, Big John McWilliams was also a very kind man and a pillar of the community back home in Pasadena, and even Julia contested that she loved him dearly despite their differences. The long and difficult road that Mastering the Art of French Cooking went through before publication is touched on in the film, though the filmmakers would be hard-pressed to include the sheer scope of time and effort that went into the book's creation. From the start of Julia's participation in September of 1952, the over 700-page manuscript went through at least two publishers and two rewrites before it was finally picked up by Kampf in 1959. While writing or rewriting the book, Julie also had to experiment with the recipes, adjust the measurements, and research ingredients that American housewives could substitute for ingredients that were not available in the States. The workload was so intense during these years that in her book, My Life in France, Julie estimates that her and Simca contributed a minimum of 40 hours per week to cook bookery. The same unfortunately could not be said for Louisette, as her duties as a wife, homemaker, and mother of two often detracted from the number of hours she spent on the book, a fact which resulted in her demotion from co-author to consultant. The movie, however, takes a somewhat different stance, insisting that Louisette's absence from the project was due instead to constant headaches and possible sheer laziness on her part. Despite numerous hurdles, however, Mastering the Art of French Cooking was finally published in September of 1961, 750 pages long and priced at $10 per copy. One of the first things I noticed while watching the film again is that it seems to suffer from a lack of cats. Julie Powell and her husband Eric had three cats and a pet snake named Zuzu, while Minette, or Pussy, the stray cat adopted by the child during their stay in Paris, is likewise absent from the film. But I'm an animal lover, so I tend to notice these things more often than most people. The one cat that does make it into the film was probably included so that the filmmakers could quote the opening of Julie's blog word for word, as she makes a remark regarding the project and the possible negative effect it might have on her cat's well-being. While film Julie cites ADHD as the source for poor housekeeping skills, as well as the reason for her inability to finish things, this fact is not mentioned in her book. While writing her blog, Julie simply comes to the conclusion that the unhappiness she feels regarding her life and career are the result of her willingness to settle, like choosing a boring yet reliable secretary job over pursuing her career as an actor. While the book does frequently reference her poor housekeeping skills, primarily her inability to keep cat hair off of every flat surface, being that she had to deal with three cats, a snake, a husband, a full-time job, not to mention a year-long cooking project, I believe that a little messiness is more than excusable given the circumstances. The film gives us a fairly accurate depiction of Julie's miserable job working as a secretary slash personal assistant at the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, a government organization dedicated to dealing with the after effects of September 11th. Though Julie's somewhat strange and intrusive boss, Nate, who makes constant appearances throughout the book, is omitted from the film entirely, and is instead replaced with Julie's cubicle mate. The annual Cobb style lunch, where Julie is forced to meet with her stuck-up, more successful friends, is a film edition, as all the friends mentioned in the printed version of her story are quite a bit friendlier. Julie's friends Sally, Gwen, and Isabel make steady appearances throughout the year of the Julie Julia project, offering encouragement and even assisting with a recipe or two. Their participation more than likely did not diminish the popularity of Julie's blog, however, as it gave her an excuse to talk about an array of subject matter from dildo dreams to the likely success of a line of sex furniture. Unlike in the film, Julie's motivation for starting the project was not the internet fame of her more successful friend Annabelle, who as they already established does not exist, but was instead something that Julie's husband Eric came up with after eating a few bowls of Julie Child style potato soup. Oh, so just quickly thought I should mention this, but the real Julie Powell, just like in the film, never ate an egg before starting the Julie Julie project, unless of course she was in cakes or pies. And just like in the film, everybody seems to be very surprised and taken aback by this fact. Another character that is omitted from the film entirely is Julie's younger brother Jordan, or Heathcliff as she likes to call him. 
Jordan slash Heathcliff stayed with Julie and Eric for a few months during the project, offering encouraging and sarcastic remarks and having to hunt down the odd marabone or two. Julie's disapproving mother also makes quite a few more appearances in the book, even traveling to New York on one occasion, where she openly distresses over the state of her daughter's new apartment. Her feelings regarding the project are more or less like they were in the film, as she frequently states her belief that the endeavor will simply put unwanted stress on her daughter's life. The failed interview for the Christian Science Monitor and the missed opportunity to meet fabled book editor Judith Jones did not evoke the same response from Julie that it does in the movie. In the film, the failed interview is the starting point of a fight between Julie and her husband Eric, while real life Julie handled the issue with a bit more tact, even going so far as to invite the reporter for dinner in spite of Miss Jones' cancellation. That's not to say that the Julie and Julie project failed to evoke any fights between Julie and her husband Eric, far from it. As calamities in the kitchen brought on more than a few meltdowns, the most devastating of which was sparked by a faulty food processor and Julie's seeming inability to make mayonnaise. The film also downplays the amount of media coverage that the project generated, as in addition to the report from the Christian Science Monitor and the New York Times interview, Julie had her picture in Newsday, was featured in a segment for CBS, and even appeared on CNN FN, along with an incredible cake decorated with three different kinds of icing. Also according to the book, CNN FN now owes Julie a cake plate. Julie's 30th birthday party, wherein she very reluctantly prepares live lobsters, is yet another film edition, as Julie and Eric spend the night before her 30th birthday attending a stage reading of Salome, which for a proud theater geek like Julie was a more than welcome birthday present. This isn't to say, however, that the project's menu did not include lobster, as an entire chapter of the book is dedicated to describing Julie's experiences dismembering crustaceans, as well as the different methods she employed to do so. Never before has a book chapter made me so happy to be a vegetarian, though on the plus side I did learn quite a bit about lobster anatomy. The scene where Julie discovers Julie Child's feelings regarding her blog played out pretty much like it did in the book. Julie just finished putting the fishing touches on her duck when a reporter from Santa Monica phoned. He told her that he had recently interviewed Julie Child for an article and that when the subject of her blog came up, the response she gave was unenthusiastic. His exact words being that she was kind of a pill about the whole thing. After hanging up the phone, Julie then exclaimed that Julie Child hated her and had a good cry while being comforted by her husband and two friends. Oh yeah, her friends Sally and Gwen were with her at the stage in the book, but seeing as how the movie saw fit to replace them with members from the bitchy Sally Eaters Club, it's no surprise that they are excluded from this point in the movie. But in both the book and the movie, the duck comes out perfectly. The trip that Julie and Eric take to visit Julie's kitchen on display at the Smithsonian Museum is accurate, as it's a stick of butter that they decide to leave in memory of Julia. Though part of me can't help but wonder what happened to the stick of butter after they left it, believing that it was either thrown away or carried home by a butter-loving security guard. After looking back at my script, I found that there were quite a few lines in the film that were ripped right out of Julie Child's book, My Life in France. Not to mention a few things I wanted to talk about but couldn't fit them in anywhere else in the script. And because I thought it was a travesty not to include them, I decided to add this section. The line where Paul compares the image of Julie at the stove to that of a kale drummer at the symphony is an actual quote taken from a letter that Paul wrote to his twin brother Charlie, as is Julie's infamous line comparing piping hot cannelloni to a man's genital region though the two lines seem not to have originated from the same letter. The remark made by the Hooten Mifflin employee regarding the cookbook, that women don't want a dictionary but something quick that they can make with a mix, is mentioned in Julie Child's book, though the employee in question was less straightforward with this suggestion, preferring to whisper it under his breath. The Valentine cards that appear in the film are actual recreations of cards that Julie and Paul send out to family and friends. Due to the craziness of the Christmas season, the Shells often found it difficult to get their Christmas cards out on time, so they opted for sending out Valentine's Day cards instead, some of which were pretty racy. I really liked watching this movie when I was younger, I felt like it had a kind of relaxing charm to it, but after finding out just how much research and effort went to presenting the life of Julie Child, I've gotta say that I think I like it even more now. The Julie Powell segments of the movie are a lot less accurate, but Miss Powell apparently didn't have much involvement with the movie, and it's not like this is the first time that Hollywood's had problems accurately adapting a book to film. The only thing left to say is... Bon Sorry, I couldn't resist.